I thought that on Mother's Day, I am supposed to put my feet up and <laughs> be spoiled, but he, he makes me work all the time. <laughs> but I'm so happy, but uh, I, I just feel like a bit, I don't know, I, I, I have a bit of heaviness this morning and also some sadness. Maybe uh, I remember those mothers that have gone before us. So I remember those uh, daughters and uh, um, sons who don't have their mothers here right now because they have gone before us. But we thank God for the life of those mothers. If they can only see how their children uh, are, are right now and how their children are going well right now, they will be proud. And so <laughs> today is that wonderful Sunday we call Mother's Day. A day when we celebrate and we put on focus mothers of this world, <laughs> the things that, uh, priceless things that they do, that um, uh, they do for their families and society. So um, congratulations, mothers. Uh, this is the time to reflect on our calling. God has called us to be mothers and we have something to do. We, we are very important in the kingdom of God. And I'd like to read a part of a poem by Diana Allen, who nicely sums up the sentiment of many mothers in a poem called, I Quit. I'm not going to read uh, everything in the poem, but just part of it. But the first part of um, her writing was that uh, she was sort of like saying all the difficult things that mothers do and that are very overwhelming in their life and in, in the way that um, they move and they live. But after explaining the hardships of parenthood, she concludes, there will be days when I'll still hunt through the yellow pages for the number of the mother's resignation hotline. Or my heart will feel as though it has been shattered into a thousand pieces. One thing is sure, however, I have to hang on, to stand firm, to fight the good fight. The souls of my children and the quality of the lives they live here on earth is at stake. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very sentimental about this. And so is their eternity. So she's saying that she couldn't quit because the future of her children depends a lot on her that she has to fight the good fight so that uh, her children will have the quality of life that they should be living on earth um, the way they deserve and the way God has planned them to live. And also that she says that in motherhood as well, the eternity, the future eternity of their children depends on how parents raise their children as well. My children are too precious for me, she says, to do anything but persevere. I, I'm sure that a lot of mothers uh, agree and uh, uh, feel the same way as this author did. So for us mothers, nothing or nobody is more important than our children. I was just reminded recently there was a riot in Baltimore. I, I don't know if you've seen that mother <laughs> Who, who saw her son throwing stone to the police. Uh, her son is, uh, was one of those that uh, uh, was uh, revolting or rebelling or um, throwing stones and even burning uh, houses and even uh, department stores. And she saw her son, she was, he was like sort of hooded, but he knows that's her son. So, um, she went near him and she pulled him, up, him out of the crowd and um, you see in the video she was caught like slapping her son and yeah, <laughs> she was so angry. Hallelujah, she was so angry. Hallelujah. I, <laughs> I think that I would do the same if I see my son doing that, crazily throwing rocks to police. How frustrating would have been for her that this child she raised turned up to be a rebellious, 
bad citizen of that city. I know that there are so many, there's some political, cultural undercurrents in this situation in Baltimore, but then that is not enough reason for our children to be um, taking the law into their hands. So she was so frustrated. Many of us parents, if not most of us, do our very best to raise our children the way we can and know. And yet, there are times we see in our children things we don't expect them to do or to be. I thought you, you would say, I have done everything I could for this child. We work hard to provide for them, enroll them in good schools, take them to Sunday school, and build, try to build some fortune for them to inherit. We work overtime just to build a comfortable life for them, we would say. And we question ourselves. What have we done wrong? Sometimes we end up frustrated. Doesn't the Bible say that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children? That's why we say we work so hard. We think we need to provide for the material needs at present and the future of our children. So that's um, what's in our mind to leave an inheritance. And the Bible says, yeah, you, uh, a man should leave an inheritance to your children and even to your children's children. When our children were very young, we heard that was the time when, you know, this uh, will, last will and testimony was, was being campaigned out to, to us and uh, they said that we should do our will, we should write our will for our children. Making Monina and Randolph the beneficiaries of whatever we have. So we chuckled then and asked, shall we write a will? We have a house, but we're still paying it off. You know, in Australia, we cannot declare we own a house if we are still paying it off, if we still have a mortgage. You um, notice in the forms that we fill up sometimes, they ask, do you own a house? Are you owning a house? So you cannot say you own a house when you're still paying the mortgage. What you think is you are owning a house. So we were said, oh, we don't own the house yet. And then we have two cars, but by the time our children are able to drive, these two cars are uh, already very old and maybe not uh, good to use anymore. Because we thought, in those, uh, we thought that wheels, just as we hear from uh, TV or some other people's lives, the rich people that they sort of like, this house belongs to John, this house belongs to Mary and things like that, and the vacation house belongs to Jack or something like that. That's what we thought it was, but no, in Australia, the, the wills will just say that these two beneficiaries uh, will have all your properties, whatever it is that was left. So since well, when my children were very young, we appointed Pastor Ian to be our <laughs> administrator. I don't know if he even knows about that. <laughs> and um, uh, we said that, uh, that th there needs to be an administrator, so he is the administrator. I don't know if we have erased it or not. The matter of inheritance is addressed throughout the Old and New Testaments. This inheritance, however, refers to both spiritual and material. Depending upon a man's godly wisdom or his foolishness, his descendants might inherit anything from prosperity to folly, you know, recklessness, stupidity, foolishness. But the Bible says that God has a will for us, that we have an inheritance from God. And that is our spiritual inheritance. In Matthew 25, verse 34, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. You see, uh, God is saying that we have an inheritance from him. And our inheritance is the kingdom. And you would say, where's the kingdom? Where's, the, where, where's our inheritance? And um, in uh, previous uh, studies that we have, the kingdom of God normally refer, refers to places or to situations where the king is. Where the king is reigning, that's the kingdom of God. So our inheritance from God is his kingdom. 
So if we have God's kingdom in our house, we have God's kingdom in our, in our uh, workplaces, in our schools, we have God's kingdom, well, we are really very blessed. Where the kingdom of God is, there is joy, you know? There's peace. Imagine you have joy and peace. Contentment in your house and in your work and your relationships. There's godliness. There's also giving. There's ministry. Uh, people serving each other and uh, being concerned about the welfare of other people. There's provision, you know. God says he will provide for all your needs according to his riches in glory. There is healing. There's health. There's strength. Righteousness. I was just reading a verse. It says that righteousness, the effect of righteousness is quietness and assurance. That righteousness gives peace. There is forgiveness in the kingdom of God. There's grace. There's eternal life. There's success. God says he wants you to be successful. He wants you to be on top, not in the bottom. He wants you to be the head, not the tail. So in the kingdom of God, there is really success and many more. This is where the presence of the Lord, the King, would be. Who would like this for their children and grandchildren? Okay? <laughs> more precious than any material sum. The values of faith, love of God, understanding of His Word, trust and obedience, and rich relationships and spiritual blessing can and should be transmitted to our children as we inherit the kingdom of God in our lives. Our Heavenly Father God is ready to show us His will designed not only to bless us with the inheritance of his goodness in our lives, but also to pass on as blessings to our kids. This morning, the challenge for us is to sow into our children's life with a purpose. As I look back to the past when uh, our children were smaller, I ask myself, did we sow into our children's life with a purpose? I remember our language of love then for our children were we took care of them, we provided for their needs, we buy them things, plenty of things, you know, a lot of toys. They had Barbie, strawberry, shortcakes, they had all these uh, uh, little dogs that are being adopted or something cabbage. in those days. What do you call it? Scrappy? <laughs> A cabbage patch, yes. And um, they have the He-Man or Transformers for my son and so many things. We brought them to holidays, taught them skills to care for themselves. We kiss them and embrace them. We teach them schoolwork and what is right and what is wrong. We defended and protected them, putting them to good schools if we can. Yes, we took them to Sunday school as well taught them to pray before meals, and tag them along Bible studies. Does this sound familiar to you? I think you've, you're doing the same thing, you've done the same thing for your children. I guess we all do this. Are these purposeful, you would ask? Yes, to a certain degree, but not enough. Do you agree? Yes. To a certain degree, but not enough. Because parenting is so crucial, and because God has called us to do certain things as moms and dads, I do want to share some truth from scripture about raising children in such a way as to set them up for a good future where they are able to withstand the world. They are able to withstand the trials and tribulations that are in the world. Though this is Mother's Day, my message is specifically targeted to all parents. Additionally, I believe God has a word for all of us here this morning, whether we are biological parents or not. We could be grandparents, godparents, we could be uncles, aunties, Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, or somehow have an influence on the young ones. Let's read and look at Psalm 78. That's the basis of our purposeful sowing to our children. Psalm 78 is a muscle. If you read uh, Psalms, there are 
uh, chapters and verses that say maskil. What is a maskil? They are really teaching psalms. It is a hymn for this home. And what does it teach? The psalm reminds us to teach our children, to teach the next generation. Our responsibility is that our kids and grandchildren understand that the real key to success is to know the Lord, to love Him, and to be obedient to Him. And let's look at four principles in Psalm 78, which the Lord gives us to follow in order that we might parent with a purpose. Let's read Psalm 78, verses 1 to 8. And it says, My people hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the, number one, praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed, number two, statutes for Jacob, established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would, number three, put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but, number four, would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to Him. So this is a very good muscle, uh, a teaching psalm. If you want to review it, you can always go back, Psalm 78. Put that in your mind because that is a very good guide in the raising of your children, the raising of your grandchildren, and even uh, in um, ministering to the young people in children's ministry or kids' life now. I, we should not call it children's ministry anymore. It's called kids' life. And that has a meaning in it, isn't it? It pertains to the life of our kids. And that is our concern and our focus in this church, helping parents to bring our children have that life that God um, ordained them to have. And first, it says, this verse says, we are to teach our children God's greatness. You know, God is so great. His, uh, the works that he does to you, he, his praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. You would really say that, oh, well, uh, that if you look at your surroundings, you can see how great our God is. And the writer of this psalm is saying, please, please, Teach this, this to your children. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. In modern t terminology, he, he is saying, pay attention. This is important stuff. These instructions are word of truth, words of wisdom, and the words of God. Then he uses references to history to drive point his points. In Ephesians 6, 4, we can find, and in other um, uh, chapters in the Bible, old and new, that parents that, um, were always admonished to nurture and bless their children, to bringing up the next generation into the people that God wants them to be. Throughout the Old Testament, there is continual admonition for parents to teach the faith to their children. Though we have Sunday school now, or we have kids' life now, it's an important teaching for us nowadays. It is a relatively new structure. The original institution for teaching children about God has really been the home. As parents, we receive from our fathers, or maybe from other people, about God, uh, instructions about God. So now the present generation would pass the history of God's working onto their children with greater understanding. It is part of our parental duty. Parents, therefore, we should learn from the God who reveals himself 
and pass their knowledge and faith on their children. Therefore, it becomes more personal to them and to you and to your family. So we have the book of God, we study, but we also should establish uh, some sort of uh, direct relationship with God that we learn from Him personally. Because if you have like personal experiences with God, they are more effective in showing to their children because they're real. It's part of their life and it's part of their family. You know, I remember while I was doing this, I remember my mother and I was just sort of sobbing a little bit. I, I grew up with a mother who was so prayerful. Um, I, she was very consistent. I know that she was sincere, truthful, purposeful, and deep. I know that sometimes when we pray at home, sometimes we just sort of not, not um, thinking about it and we continue our, our task and things like that. But she is really very purposeful, my mother she was. And uh, I haven't really eaten dinner or any meals in my house, in our house, then without her or us uh, praying for our food and thanking God for our provision. We couldn't like sort of wait, uh, eat just if we like to eat, but we wait for everyone to sit down and she would pray and you would really feel her prayers. Now I realize that that's how my mother was. I, I was not thinking about it. I thought that uh, she was just praying, but now I realize I, I, I see from her the faith and the belief in God and the trust. You know, if you are a child, you look at your parents. So that's how I looked at her and now I realize that she was really that and she taught us how to sing uh, uh, songs uh, before we eat and um, like we sang, I remember four songs now I have written. I think that I should write this because I'd like to pass this on to my grandchildren. I don't know what happened. Uh, I, I taught my children, but along the way, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Everything was forgotten. I don't know what happened. So I have to write this song. There, there was a song in Ilocano. Apo umay kakadakam, dito yan mi apanganan. To ikanan mi bendisyon ng espiritu punuen nakam. Amen. We say God is great and God is good. And you will see that's expression of hers that it's really true in her and she really believed it. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. Father, we thank you for the night and for the pleasant morning light, for rest and food and loving care and all that makes the day so fair. Very simple, but because she has shown us the truthfulness and the honesty and the integrity of her faith, I think that without knowing it, it was somehow passed on a little bit, but I failed to pass it on to my children. When they were young, we sang, but now I don't know what happened. So, <laughs> God help us. <laughs> Notice that we are to tell of his praiseworthy deeds. The awesome things God has done to the world and our family. Tell, him of, tell them of his awesome creation. You know, it's so easy, nature. You tell your children, who, who made the tree? Can men make the tree? Who made the mountains? Who made the hailstorm? It's like that. Who made the rain? And you, it's so easy to tell our children, to remind them of how great and how big our God is. And um, also, where am I now? <laughs> uh, you can tell them about your human you know, anatomy as well. Like, oh, can God, can anyone uh, create a heart? No, it was God who created your heart. It was God who created you. And so it's so easy to, to do that. Tell them how he has saved you and changed you. How he has healed sickness in your family. When our grandkids grow older a little bit, you know, I will tell them God's greatness to our family, how he saved grandma's life from drowning. I nearly drowned when I was um, single. Uh, I will tell them about the, those car accidents that grandpa had. <laughs> so many, I couldn't count. <laughs> And I'll tell them how God answered our prayers for the miraculous healing of my grandson Ryan when he caught a very rare disease 
which got him in hospital for a month and a coma in a week, just at less than two years old. I let them know how he guided us in many decisions in our life with his wisdom and provision. Oh, I can tell them a lot of things about God's workings in our family, even in the finances, for instance. There are times when, uh, just recently, my husband was saying, oh, I spent my money for registration, car registration, car insurance, and things like that, and it costs this much for my budget this month. And so, but God is good. We were, <laughs> we were invited to a, this um, wonderful pastors and elders have, and uh, other leaders have uh, organized a little di uh, a dinner for my husband's birthday last night. And we told them, email them, please do not give any presents. We don't l like any presents at the moment. You please don't collect anything or something like that. Because they do collect uh, every year. And uh, we sort of feel this year that, no, we don't want that. We want us to just enjoy. But when we were there, they just insisted on giving. And they've collected. And when we got home and we counted what we have, and they said, this is exactly the amount that I've spent for my insurance <laughs> and for my, for my um, car registration. And you see how God is really that uh, in emergency expenses, I've never like sort of um, had, we had, don't have an experience that when we, we, needed, we needed money or something finances, God always comes. And, or we spend our money on emergency things and God always gives it back. So how good uh, God is to us and we should share that, those things to our uh, children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. <laughs> Can you think of situations in your life and family where God's work and greatness was made manifest. You know, truly I know that you've got a lot of experiences as well. These are faith-building exercises. We never know, but as we tell the stories about our, conquer, our conquering through, uh, because of God and our victories, the provisions of our needs because of God, healing of our diseases, because it's all from God. You wouldn't say that you have a lot of money because you are so intelligent and you, you, you are paid very highly. No. God gave you the intelligence. God created you. God opened up opportunities for all those companies to work. So it points back to God. Everything points back to God. So those are faith-building exercises for your children. A storytelling of personal and family experiences will teach them firsthand that God is real and powerful. Do we want our children growing up with a high regard, respect, and belief in God? Of course we do. Then tell them your personal stories freely. In addition to heart-wrenching stories from the Bible, I would suggest engaging conversations or storytelling at dinner or family outings, or just when sitting in the living room together. Make time consciously for this purpose. It is important. It is our responsibility. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your work to another. They tell of your mighty acts. The second thing that the Psalm 78 tells us to tell our children is, number two, God's word. It says here, he decreed his statutes. Statutes are the word of God. For Jacob established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children. Notice here that there is a multi-generational aspect in the, these verses. You know, ancestors, forefathers, their children, the children yet to be born, and their children, four generations. The psalmist is talking about four generations. Grandparents, your spiritual assignment is not over when your children are grown. You are to influence your grandchildren spiritually as well. It's not always easy to teach children of God's word. Sometimes our own lack of knowledge, understanding, and commitment hinder us. 
But remember to keep on learning and learning because the teacher must always learn more than the student. Sometimes our supposed lack of time hinders our teaching of the word to children. We can make time for what's important, and the psalmist puts utmost importance on this task. You know, you would say, I don't have time, but how many hours have you done Facebook today? <laughs> Talking to myself. Uh, <laughs> how many hours have you done sitting down and watching a Korean or a, a Filipino telesery? <laughs> yeah. If we can make time for leisure, you know, nowadays you can see people going out all the time, bonding, bonding over everywhere and relaxation, you know. The gym, okay, that's important for your health. Meeting and catching up with friends over a cup of coffee. You know, this nice coffee, nice restaurants, right? Right now they just like entice you to go there and relax and be selfish. <laughs> and while your children are in your house. <laughs> I'm not making you guilty. Those are all good, but there has to be a balance, you know? We can surely make time for what is important for us and our children. The word and witness whom God has given in the past are for the instruction of future generations. They are not only pertinent, they are vital for the guidance and faith of future generations. In the maze of moral confusion in our world, you know, there's so much happening in the world, I, sometimes you just wonder. And God's word serves to guide. God's word strengthens. God's word protects. How would you want your children to be guided in this kind of world? By God, to be strengthened. By God, to be protected by God in this kind of world. So we, we don't have any choice, but we don't have any help that we can trust and depend but our God. So it's good to, to set up our children in that kind of um, thinking that it's God that they should go to first before anything else. To neglect to teach our children the word of God is to deprive them of God's precious truth, you know? A truth about God, if you don't teach them the word, how, do, how would they know about God, the truth about God? The truth about life, and how they should live it effectively. The truth about themselves, who are they? That God created them, that God, even in the, in the womb of their mothers, uh, God is already thinking about them. Who are they? That God, they are precious. That God loves them, that God died, died for them. They are somebody, they are precious in God's sight. We need to provide our children with every opportunity to come to know God through his divine revelation. We teach our children about the Lord so that they might come to know the Lord personally. So they will come to know how to walk with him. And they will come to know him better and better. This will strengthen them emotionally, mentally, physically, as they live their life in this world, and as they relate to people and encounter difficulties and hardships. Some parents think, Okay, they need to let their kids make their own decisions about religion, about God. Oh, let them decide when they grow up about church attendance, about Bible study. Are you that parent? But here, the Bible says we are to teach our children in order that they might have hope in God rather than be beaten down by the storm of life and the madness of culture. We need to constantly tell our kids about the blessings that will come their way if they walk according to God's word and the heartbreak they'll experience if they choose a different direction. What a privileged responsibility we've been granted. Number three, uh, Psalm 78 says we have to teach our children to trust God. Verse 7 begins with another objective or reason for teaching the coming generations, that they should put their confidence in, in God and not forget the works of God. So how can we teach our children to trust God? We teach our children to trust God by trusting God ourselves. You know? And by sharing stories, both biblical and personal, about God's faithfulness with them. 
These stories relay how Israel forgot about the Lord's works and how it resulted in their failures. How could they forget? You know, the Israelites, how could they forget? God had done so many miracles, like the parting of the Red Sea, the providing of their food, the manna from heaven, water from the rock, you know, the tower of fire by night and the cloud by day. How could they forget so great a deliverance? Yet we do the same thing. We forget what God has done for us after a while. And to help their memory after God parted the Jordan for Israel to pass through, Joshua set up stones to commem commemorate God's mighty acts so future generations would remember. What are we doing to commemorate God's mighty works in our lives? You know, I just remember on our 25th anniversary, we are also a family here as a church, isn't it? Uh, we sang songs like, we will remember, and we reminisce the past 25 years with God's hand and faithfulness in our church life through a video of accounts from people of what they have seen and they have witnessed about God's great work and faithfulness to the church and its members. Do you remember that, young people, the video that we had on our 25th anniversary about how our church started, what, uh, we've, what was done, what, how God led us to, to forming a church like this? I hope you remember them. I hope you remember them and you pass them on. Pass them on to, to the, the people that you take care of so that they will know that they belong to a church where God's faithfulness was seen over 25 years. Same as true with our families, that we should remember, we should always maybe on a yearly thing do uh, uh, talking, telling stories so that our children will remember, so that they will remember because that's the only way they can trust God. They have to know that God is to be trusted. How can you trust someone if you don't know someone? So if we teach them about God, about the Word of God, about the things that God has done for us, then that will be the basis of their trust. So to you as well, sometimes we have problems in trusting God. We do things in our own way. And uh, we just uh, do things before God can do anything for us. We've asked Him, but we sort of do things uh, before He can do something for us. I think that we should also Think about ourselves, remember what God has done in your life. He has saved you, he has provided for all your needs. Remember that, and so that your trust in him. Uh, remember also the creation, remember all the good things that he has done around you, and that will be the basis of your trust in God. And you will be able to relate it to your children because it shows in your actions. Like what I said about my mother, it showed in her action that he re she really trusted God. And so some, uh, I, in, in a way, I saw that and I can see it and it makes the God who I trust even bigger and I should trust him even more. The sin of misery and misery of man is that he has forgotten God by forgetting what God has done for him. When that happens, you know, when we forget God, we forget what he has done, we begin to place our confidence in ourselves. We begin to place our confidence in men or in material things or in his achievements instead of the God of history and revelation. A person's trust in God is developed by his experiences with God and the things he hears about other people's experiences. So it must, these things must be alive. It must be talked about in our families so that our children will see who the God that they need to trust is. And number four, the parents are to teach our children to obey God. I saw a, a saying, I think it came from Christine Kane of Hillsong about uh, obedience. She said, obedience is actually very simple. It's just not easy. So obedience is really one of our problems as people. And I think even as Filipinos, you know, uh, obedience is one of our problems. So we should teach our generations, our next generations, 
about obedience so that they would keep God's commands. No? Uh, uh, well, we need to teach our children to keep God's commandments. They need to learn to be doers of the word and not hearers only who delude themselves. I, okay, we need to help our children build their own set of convictions while they are young. When our children leave home, we can't make their decisions for them. Remember, Joseph went away from home but was still able to fight temptation, saying, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Because Joseph was grounded in the word and trusted God, he grew up into a man of God who made a difference in the world. We must teach our children by example. Do you ever say, when your phone rings at home, do you ever say, tell them I'm not home, but then get upset when your kids tell a lie? <laughs> we must model obedience to our children. Do you drive and you beat the red light and the children are at the back? Or do you, do you crush into a car and without knowing that you just go away because the owner is not there or something like that? Or maybe you have taken something out from the department store, something like that. So a lot of examples that we need to leave so that our children will be able to obey God as well. We have to teach them obedience by being obedient ourselves. Uh, I read um, uh, an account of like um, a comparison uh, between two men, you know? That the difference between a godly man and an ungodly man. And it says here, Jonathan Edwards, we know him, don't we? Whose most famous sermon was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, was a giant of the faith. The Lord used mightily to ignite one of the few genuine revivals in our country. But he not only preached to his congregation, he preached to his family as well. And a study revealed that of his direct descendants, 14 became college presidents, 101 became college professors, 106 became ministers and missionaries, and 108 became lawyers and doctors. On the other hand, a name Jacob Jukes, a man named Jacob Jukes, mocked Jonathan Edwards and the revival. Here is what happened to Jukes' family. 400 were physically self-incapacitated. That is, they lost limbs or were otherwise unable to function due to inflictions from fights and brawls. 310 became professional paupers. 60 became thieves. And seven were convicted of murder. Only 20 became tradesmen. And 10 of those 20 learned their trade while serving in a penitentiary. Jonathan Edwards embraced the things of God and taught them to his children. Jacob Jukes marked the things of God and the fruit of both men is apparent. Verse eight prophesies what the result will be if we don't teach our children the word of God and not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation a generation whose heart were not loyal to God and whose spirit were not faithful to God. Four sins is mentioned here that result from not obeying God. Number one, stubbornness of those in Israel who refused to be taught the word was legendary. Number two, the rebellious are those who won't listen to God. The unprepared in heart are those who refuse, refuse to establish themselves in the word and way of the Lord. The last listed are the unfaithful or those who have other priorities that are more important to them than faithfulness to God. Okay, I'm gonna close soon. <laughs> and I just want to tell about this story. A man came home from work to find his house in chaos. You know, uh, as he comes home, he saw his children were outside still in their pajamas playing in the mud inside the house a lamp had been knocked over 
The throw rugs was wedded against the wall, and the living room was littered with toys and clothing. Dishes filled the kitchen sink. Cereal was spilled on the counter, and a broken glass lay under the table. The dad went upstairs, stepping over toys and piles of clothes, looking for his wife. She was still in bed in her pajamas, reading a novel. She looked up at him, smiled, and asked how his day was. Never mind my day, the husband said. What happened here today? And she said, you know, every day when you come home from work and ask me what I did today, well, today I didn't do anything. <laughs> you feel doing that sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> A wife not taking care of her house would eventually be problematic. But parents not raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord will find their children's earthly tent in far worse condition. In closing, I'd like to just bring this all together. Mothers, mothers, 16 and above, you can do a difference in the world. You have a significant spiritual impact in your family. And you can do that by teaching your children God's greatness. Teach your children about God's word. What is saying about them and about life so that they may be able to trust God and they may be able to obey God. Okay? Each generation must hear the story of salvation and so choose to trust God. Only then can your family and the next generation be sure of the blessing of the Lord. And I want to close this morning by reading a poem entitled, My Mother. Your love, I know, it says. I've seen your tears. You've given to me my life. You've walked through hours and days and years of heartache, toil, and strife to see that I could have the best that you could give me. You gave up needs, and you even gave up, often, your rest. You viewed eternity to do his will, my highest call, and by your special care, I stood and walked and did not fail. You held me up in prayer. Though strands of gray may brush your hair and miles divide our way, I know that by your quiet prayer, you've helped me day by day. You've shown me how to give, to share, to put my own needs last. You've helped me see and be aware that life is soon to pass. Despite your love, I would not dare, for there is not another who spreads her gentle love and care like you, my loving mother. Okay, happy Mother's Day to everyone. Thank you.